Hello, I'm Rachel St. John, and I'm one of the American Academy of Pediatrics Early Hearing Detection and Intervention Chapter Champions for the State of Texas. I'm also the director for the Family Focused Center for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Children at Dallas Children's Medical Center. Today, I'm happy to have the opportunity to discuss effective care for young patients who are deaf or hard of hearing. According to the Center for Disease Control and the American Speech Language Hearing Association, the incidence of congenitally deaf and hard of hearing infants is three in 1,000 live births. In the past, this has been considered what we call a low incidence condition, most likely due to the fact that it's invisible by nature and universal newborn hearing screening is only a development in recent history. Infants are identified as congenitally deaf or hard of hearing more frequently than common congenital conditions such as cleft lip, spina bifida, or Down syndrome in children born to mothers under the age of 25. The American Academy of Pediatrics, along with other organizations, consider infants and young children who are deaf or hard of hearing to be experiencing a developmental emergency. If infants are not exposed to and are unable to develop language fully as they grow, they will not be able to adequately make their needs known, develop healthy peer and romantic relationships, express emotions, succeed academically, or develop abstract reasoning needed for advanced careers, among other things that are typically attained during the course of a person's lifetime. Language is what connects us to each other as human beings. It's important to recognize that early language access can come in the form of spoken language, signed language, or both. Research from field experts, such as Mayberry, Nussbaum Wadi Smith, Hassanzada, and Park, demonstrate that early introduction to signed language does not impede the development of spoken language and may actually facilitate it. So how early is early when it comes to identifying and supporting deaf and hard of hearing infants? Research from pioneers in the field, such as Christine Yoshinaga Atano and Mary Pat Moeller, has demonstrated that the identification and provision of intervention services for deaf and hard of hearing infants by six months of age leads to significantly better developmental outcome. The AAP EDI, or Early Hearing Detection and Intervention Program, makes recommendations to medical home providers regarding the timing of newborn hearing screening and follow-up. This is what we commonly refer to as the 136 timeline. The one in the 136 model refers to screening. By no later than one month of age, all infants should have received a newborn hearing screening. This usually takes place in the hospital nursery before discharge home. But it is also important for providers to recognize that the responsibility of facilitating scheduling of that screening may fall within the scope of the medical home. Some infants, for example, are born outside hospital settings where hearing screening is not accessible, such as in birthing centers or in the home. Additionally, on occasion, providers may not have access to documentation of screening even if it has already been done and the parent has reported it has been done. The provider will need to take the initiative to have his or her staff contact the birth hospital or even the state eddy coordinator to obtain documentation of hearing screening results. If a screening has not yet been done by the time the infant has their first visit with the primary care provider, the infant needs to be scheduled for a screening with an outpatient hearing screening provider. 
The three in 136 refers to identification. Infants who have not passed their newborn hearing screening should be seen by a pediatric audiologist for a diagnostic evaluation by no later than three months of age. It is critical for providers to be aware that audiologists with pediatric training are the appropriate professionals to evaluate these children. The six in the 136 timeline refers to intervention. By no later than six months of age, infants who have been identified as deaf or hard of hearing should have intervention services in place. All infants and children who have been identified as deaf or hard of hearing should be offered subspecialty services including ear, nose, and throat, ophthalmology, and genetics at minimum. Early Childhood Intervention, or ECI, is also a critical referral that needs to be made as soon as possible so that services can be initiated. These services would include deaf education early intervention services provided in partnership with the child's local school district and may also include other intervention services such as speech, physical, and or occupational therapy, depending on the individual child's needs. Referrals to other subspecialty services may need to be made by the medical home provider, particularly for children who have multiple medical needs in addition to their hearing status. Some infants may pass their initial hearing screen but have risk factors for developing later onset hearing changes. It is extremely important for medical home providers to be aware of these patients and have some kind of mechanism in place for following their hearing status. The AAP includes a list of late onset risk factors that need to be considered in addition to the 136 guidelines. Perhaps the most important is to recognize that parent or caregiver concern regarding hearing, speech, or language development is critical. Parental concern is one of the most sensitive indicators available for late onset hearing changes, as parents and caregivers are the ones who spend the most time with their children. Parental or caregiver concern warrants an immediate referral to pediatric audiology for an evaluation, and time should not be spent on additional screening in the outpatient office, as children with mild and unilateral hearing changes can easily be missed. The additional high-risk indicators for late-onset hearing changes include the following. Neonatal intensive care unit stay of more than five days duration, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO, which allows extremely sick infants with substantial heart or lung problems a better chance of recovery, ventilator support, medications such as the mycin group of antibiotics or loop diuretics, which are known to cause changes in hearing, Exchange transfusion for extremely high levels of jaundice, also known as hyperbilirubinemia. Infections during pregnancy, such as cytomegalovirus, herpes, rubella, syphilis, and toxoplasmosis. Infections after birth associated with hearing changes, including bacterial and viral meningitis. Head and face abnormalities, particularly those that involve the ear cartilage, ear canal, ear tags, ear pits, and the temporal bones of the skull. Findings suggestive of a syndrome associated with hearing change, such as Wardenberg, Alport, Gervell Lang Nielsen, and Pendred syndrome. Syndromes that are associated with progressive or delayed onset hearing change, such as neurofibromatosis osteopetrosis, and Usher syndrome. Neurodegenerative disorders, such as Hunter syndrome, 
or sensory motor neuropathies such as Friedrich ataxia or Charcot-Marie tooth disease. Head trauma, especially basal skull or temporal bone fracture that requires hospitalization. And chemotherapy. The current recommendation is that any child with one or more of these high-risk factors should be evaluated by a pediatric audiologist once by 24 to 30 months of age, regardless of their developmental status. This does not mean that providers or parents should wait if any delays are suspected. This is simply a minimum recommendation. Referral to a pediatric audiologist should be made immediately for any suspected developmental delay, particularly in speech and language. It's critical for providers to have a system to track patients in their practice, whether it's via electronic medical record or paper charting. Expanding the problem list to include at risk for hearing loss with an associated ICD-9 code of V49.89 or the soon to be associated ICD-10 code is one way to keep these patients from slipping through the cracks. Many EMRs can also be modified to provide pop-up reminders for providers after a specific time period has passed to follow up on hearing status. In summary, following the EDI 136 timeline to promote the early identification of infants and children who are deaf and hard of hearing gives the best opportunity for children's development. Children who have risk factors for later onset hearing changes are at risk of delayed identification and support if they are not tracked and followed closely over time by their medical home provider. Keeping these guidelines in mind can help maximize the cognitive, language, and psychosocial development of children who are deaf and hard of hearing. We hope you found this information helpful. For more information, please view the additional links for this module that are posted on the Texas EDI statewide campaign website. Thank you for joining us.